And hello, everybody. I'm David Schuster reporting for Quick Hits News on the HAPS TV live app. So good to have you on tonight. We've got a great show ahead. Uh, lots of news, of course. Amy Coney Barrett has now been confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court as she has taken the oath. Uh, we also have some new polling data in the Trump versus Biden battle, which, of course, we have the election in seven days. Also, some intri intriguing data regarding our early voting. We now have more people who have voted early, uh, 65 million than voted early, and cast absentee ballots in 2016. And keep in mind, we have another six days of early voting to go. We're going to be talking about all of this with a distinguished guest tonight, Ken Del Vecchio. If I can bring him in, I'm going to hit the button. Um, I'm a little slow on the take here, Ken, but that's the technology. Hold on a sec. Okay. Ken Del Vecchio, he's now on screen. There he is. Um, he is a uh, former judge. He's a lawyer. He's a legal expert. He has written textbooks about uh, the law. He's also been a political strategist for Republicans. Ken, welcome to HAPS TV. Good to have you on board. So let's start. Uh, I'm going to drop the picture of uh, Biden and put up the picture of Amy Coney Barrett. First of all, um, the speed with which she was confirmed to the Supreme Court by the U.S. Senate. Uh, what do you make of it? Were you surprised? I wasn't really surprised, David, and that's for two reasons. Number one, they gave such a hard, unreasonable time in the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh that I believe completely backfired on the Democrats that, especially during this election season, they did not want to make that same kind of mistake because I think it would really hurt Biden. Second reason is Amy Coney Barrett is a flawless candidate. Uh, it's one thing if you're opposed to her politically, political ideology. I understand certain people obviously don't want conservative, liberty-minded justices on the Supreme Court because they're looking for something else in the way of politics. That aside, I, of course, myself am completely uh, freedom-minded, libertarian-minded, conservative, Republican-minded, so I'm psyched to have her on board. But you can't argue with this woman's background. I mean, she's a, a scholar she's a professional jurist she was uh, extremely well respected by the notre dame uh faculty and student body she uh, somebody being a mother doesn't make anybody exceptional or being a father doesn't make anybody exceptional what makes people exceptional is you're a great mother and her having seven children two of them being adopted from a country like haiti that's a really repressed country going out of her way makes her even that much more of a star. There's nothing in her background to detract from her. I think it made sense. What about the argument? She's never argued a case before the United States Supreme Court. She's never argued a case uh, herself in any sort of court. She's, she's, she served as a professor. She was then an appellate judge, but that's it in terms of the limits of her experience. How about the argument that she served the United States Supreme Court as a clerk which in and of itself is more experienced than 99.999 plus percent of lawyers will ever get in terms of going before the Supreme Court. I do think it's a valid point, David, uh, that she is not a trial attorney, does not have that background. But with any particular candidate, if you took me, I've never argued a case before the United States Supreme Court. I've also never been a clerk. However, I've tried over 400 cases, and I'm the author of some of the best-selling legal books in the country. I'd make a great candidate, too, but I don't have certain pedigree that she, that she has. Well, you do have, uh, you, look, a lot of people would argue that you've got more experience, that uh, you've got more practical experience. Uh, you've certainly been around. I want to ask you to put on your political hat uh, for a second on all of this. I mean, the Democrats argue that because Republicans refuse to even allow a hearing over Merrick Garland with more than 200 days before the 2016 election, that therefore for the Republicans to jam through Amy Coney Barrett was essentially hypocrisy. Um, does this cut politically against any Republican Senate, uh, senators who are up for election in a week? No. There's hypocrisy on both sides of the coin here. Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself said that a president doesn't stop becoming president in the fourth year of his or her term. And she said that in 2016 when the Democrats wanted Garland to have his nomination hearing. Uh, the Republicans control the Senate. The Republicans control the White House. Thus, the Republicans can put somebody on the United States Supreme Court. Thus, the Republicans can choose not to hold a hearing. I personally thought it was a mistake in 2016 when they didn't give Garland his hearing. I think they should have gave him his hearing and summarily voted him down. 
because <laughs> of the fact that it's it's nothing against him personally. It's nothing against his background as a jurist. It's about what I said earlier. I want conservatives and liberty minded people on the United States Supreme Court. I think that optics wise, they should have gave him his hearing. Legally, they did not have to. It's an incredibly weak argument, especially because you have people like Schumer, Pelosi, and almost every other Democrat that's in the United States Senate and the House of Representatives, for that matter, making the reverse argument that they made in 2016. So it's too bad. All's fair and love war and when you control the Senate and the president. <laughs> well, you know, actually, I, I disagree with Ken, but he makes a uh, he, look, he makes a good argument. He's a practice lawyer. Uh, he's been a good judge. Um, I want to invite everybody to join the live chats. We've already got 12 going over HAPS. You can join the live chats through HAPS, through Twitter, Periscope, Facebook. Put your comments on there and we will respond to them. And Ken, a couple of hellos from you from uh, Drew, Drew Shepard in Los Angeles, Mark Goldman in California, Brett Walker. Hello from L.A. A lot of people in L.A. tonight. Uh, San Jose, we got to Donna Brewer. Hello, Donna. Good to have you on board. A long time, I-24, Al Jazeera, previously MSNBC viewer. Um, Ken, one of the arguments that somebody's already put up on the board is that, um, and I'm going to read this for you, uh, she took money, this comes from Mark, she took lecture money from a white hate group without asking questions beforehand. Um, is that a problem if somebody takes a speaking fee and doesn't know much about the organization that they're speaking to? Mark, please be realistic. Come on. <laughs> Every single politician, meaning elected official, has taken money from people who they don't know what their background is, and many of them will never know the vast majority of what their backgrounds are. You can't check every donor. You can't check every organization that puts in some money that brings you in as a lecturer, brings you in to speak somewhere. When you're on this kind of level of not just politics, but law, or anything that's involved with entertainment, you're constantly dealing with groups of people who are involved in supporting you and those who don't support you. So for, let's say that there was a bad apple in the mix that doesn't support her. Well, there's bad apples in the mix that do support her as well. And it's not a valid argument. Ken, there's also an argument about whether or not she should recuse herself now from any legal battles that may arise from the 2020 election let's just suppose and i don't think that this is going to be a close election we'll get into that in a second based on the latest day in the polling we'll get into that in a moment but let's just suppose that uh, we can't get an accurate count on november the third or several days later and there become court battles like we had in bush v gore 20 years ago should amy coney barrett recuse herself from any court battles that come to the supreme court absolutely not uh Every single judge that's on the United States Supreme Court came in as a political nominee by a president. Every single person that's on the United States Supreme Court and that's ever been on the United States Supreme Court and is on any court, for that matter, is a judge in any position, uh, has some kind of political thought processes, has some kind of predisposition. You don't become a judge and then magically lose whatever political ideologies that you have. You are not supposed to employ those political ideologies within the decisions that you make on the bench. And we have to take every justice and every judge at their word that they're not going to employ their political predispositions, but rather they're going to be neutral politically and they're going to only utilize the law to help them make decisions. The fact that Amy Coney Barrett is the latest appointee on the bench does not make her any more or any less likely to utilize political thought processes, nor should we be talking about Kavanaugh or Gorsuch in that manner. And for that matter, we shouldn't be talking in that manner, a matter about Sotomayor or any of the liberals that are on the United States Supreme Court or the gentleman who seems to be kind of coming straight down the middle, and that's the Chief Justice. Well, let me give you an example. It was just the last week, and I'm spacing on here, whether it was North Carolina or Pennsylvania, but there was a Supreme Court case which ended up being a 4-4 tie and which essentially allowed the state to continue counting ballots after November the 3rd. Uh, if the Republicans, if the conservatives on the court had won more, they could have sided with the Republicans from that particular state and said, no, the ballots must be tallied up. You cannot accept ballots after November the 3rd. Would it be fair for her to suddenly jump in and say, okay, I'm your fifth vote and I have a strong opinion on this and go ahead and uh, stop uh, and change the ruling that we had last week? Or would it be better for her to say, okay, look, the precedent that was just established last week was that the court can't, can't make a decision. I'm not going to bother to be part of this. Gosh, I wish she was there, David, uh, uh, as, you, as you don't. <laughs> and I wish she was there and I wish she did make that decision. 
Okay, I'm going to answer that twofold. I'm going to answer it quickly. Uh, first is is that she can't retroactively come on board to a case, a particular case, and make a decision. Uh, I don't think that that is there. There is no precedent for that. And nor do I think that that's fair under a system. That said, if a brand new case comes up, there's something called stare decisis, it's looking at previous cases, and she does not have to be guided by stare decisis, even very recent. She can come in with her own legal judgment, and it would be totally fundamentally fair and within the judicial system uh, precedents for her to override that decision. Ken, that is why I love you, because I don't always agree with you, but I always learn something from you. So in other words, if this particular case from Pennsylvania, North Carolina, whatever it was, if they resubmit it and it goes right back to the Supreme Court, uh, she can't jump in at that point. But if it's another state that has even, let's suppose it's a similar issue, but it's a separate state, a separate case, then she has the right to go ahead and, and get involved. Do I have That's that right? correct. This, this other case is decided. It's over. So it's, yeah. it's, it's precedent. It's law now. It, it's going to take another case to override it. Gotcha. I want to move on from Amy Coney Barrett. And by the way, we've got 20, 20 live chats uh, already, which is uh, pretty quick. And we're talking with Kenneth Del Vecchio. If you want to be part of the conversation, you can uh, join us through Twitter, through Periscope, through Facebook. And once again, I'm having my uh, cursor problem here. <laughs> Hold on a sec. So I can lose the Amy Coney Barrett. Well, I may not lose it, but uh, let's see. My cursor is uh, stuck. So we're going to talk. We're going to sit. We're going to keep the Amy Coney Barrett photograph open for uh, for a minute until I can figure this why out. Why not? She uh, looks not? very judicial and she looks uh, very much of a leader for women of all different backgrounds and people in total. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, tired of, I'm tired of hearing things about, you know, it should be a woman or it should be a person of this particular background. She's just the best candidate and she's impressive for everybody, as, as is Ruth, Gator, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I agree with almost nothing with Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, politically, but I th think that she led an incredibly successful life. We've got a picture of people voting early. Uh, according to the latest data, uh, 65 million early votes in this election, that has now eclipsed the 58 million early votes uh, from 2016. And 2016, that also included the early mail-in ballots that arrived by election day. We still have another uh, six or seven days, depending on where you live, to vote early. And there's every indication that the number of early votes sometime this week will actually eclipse the total number of votes that were cast in 2016. Ken, what do you make of it and how do you explain it? Well, I don't think that the early votes are in favor of President Trump, unfortunately, <clears throat> because I think the way that the politics has spread things out, <clears throat> the greater percentage of people who are voting early by mail, I should, I should really caution what I'm talking about is by mail, are going to be Democrats. The people who are voting early by way of going to polls, for instance, in places like Florida, in person, are going to weigh in favor of the president. The people who vote on on election day itself are going to weigh in favor of the president. Why is this occurring via politics? Well, look, fundamentally, it's gone straight down party lines with how people are handling the coronavirus. And people who are Democrats are, are in more of the, let's say, uh, cautious, fearful um, group about getting together with groups of people. And they're voting more through the mail. People who are Republicans, uh, and libertarians, for that matter, uh, are not. They're they're looking at the coronavirus for what it really is. It's something that's exactly like the flu, and it even has a lower death rate, as a matter of fact. And they're they're going to go. People, a lot of people take issue with that, but 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 keep going. So so the bottom line is, it's it's cutting down the political lines. More people are voting in person are going to be Republicans. More people who are voting by mail are Democrats. I, I believe that the, the right now the numbers are extraordinary uh, of the people who have voted by mail. That obviously weighs in favor of Joe Biden. Uh, I believe that the numbers are also much higher than they've been ever in the past of in-person voting at this early stage. Those are in favor of Donald Trump. There's still a ton of people to vote. And I think you're probably, I'm guessing, going in the other way than I was on a prediction I think that Donald Trump is going to win, and I think he's going to win decisively. I think a lot more people are going to be coming out Election Day, and I think that coupled with the people that are voting in person at the polls, those um, numbers will together wane. Fred.
explain it like this. The polls to me are, are as a threshold issue, false. I don't believe in them. Uh, I don't believe that they're legitimate uh, and on many fronts. That means that although there's some honest people, just like there are in every business, honest people, there are some people who are dishonest in the polling industry, and that's the starting point. More so than that, meaning like the people who are running the polls, I, I think that they're fabricating numbers in some cases. As unfortunate as, as that sounds, I do not believe it's a conspiracy theory. I believe it's a fundamental reality. Number two, and even more... Yes, absolutely. absolutely. I, I think it because it weighs in favor of the candidate who has the higher polling. It's momentum. I, I it's it's just, you know, I'm not saying that Republicans wouldn't do the same thing. Uh, I, I just think that these that that just like the mainstream media, just like Hollywood, just like the academic world, it's largely dominated by Democrats. So are the major polls. So the major, you know, it's, it's major news publications that are largely running them. That's just one point, though. And then that's, and, you know, and that's a threshold point. The bigger points are polling questions are biased, but here's the greatest thing in 2020. The silent majority is huge. It's bigger than it's ever been in the history of the United States. People are afraid to say that they're in support of Donald Trump. People literally lose their jobs just for talking about being in favor of Donald Trump and being in favor of Republican policies. It's an incredibly volatile time. People that are in favor of like, let's say Black Lives Matter, None of these people are afraid to say that they're in favor of Black Lives Matter. They're not afraid to put up signs in front of their houses for Black Lives Matter. But people are afraid to even put up signs for the president, lawn signs. So people are just not speaking. In 2016, that was the case. Now it's even more so. Even people who are exiting the polls, they're like, what do you want me to tell you? What do you want me to say? Oh, you want me to say I voted for Biden? I voted for Biden. I don't believe in the polls. And I truly believe that Donald Trump is going to win fairly decisively. And I, I wouldn't take that for granted, David. I would, as, 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 meaning like I, I think everybody needs to get out there and vote. I think Biden's got substantial strength behind him, not because people are so favorable for him, but because they're so against Donald Trump. Well, as usual, you inject, you inject logic into the equation, which, which many people that might be coming down on my side might not realize how you somewhat subterfuge, and I'm only going to say somewhat subterfuge my argument by, by pointing out that if you're looking at it comparatively between 2016 and 2020, the polling numbers that were wrong in 2016 were off by X number of points, and maybe things are off by X number of points right now. And if you pull that out of the equation, then all of a sudden these factors that I bring in might show that Trump is is a little bit is a little bit behind, even removing all those factors that I enumerated. And and I, I give you credit for for uh, you know injecting kind of a, a mathematical. E equation with logic. 
That said, I think that the polling is so far off, especially because of the silent majority. I think the silent majority is saliently loud. And, and if I could be real loud about it, I would like to point out that I rarely like to invoke anecdotal scenarios, but I've had so many anecdotal scenarios where people tell me that they're afraid. And this comes across the board that they're afraid to vote for Trump and people who have admitted to me that in 2016, they did not vote for Trump. And now they're going to vote for Trump. I, I think it outweighs it. As far as the negativity factor, I don't think that's going to help Biden all that much. I think Hillary Clinton was a monumentally better candidate for the Democrat Party because, let's face it, she's so much more astute. She's a much stronger person. Uh, she's much smarter than Joe Biden. And her mental faculties, quite honestly, are at a at, were at, are and then at a, at a much greater level. And I, I just don't think that Biden uh, has the support that's, that, that appears to be behind him. I, I just read Peter's question myself and, you know, Peter, look, let's just be honest here. The way that the media, uh, the way that academia, the way that Hollywood, the way that all the sources that propagandize people's lives lay out attacks against Trump followers is so egregious at this point that, you know, there, most people aren't like me who have a, a platform to come out and argue things as part of our livelihood. Their livelihood, in many cases, truly is dependent upon them shutting up. And that's really scary to live in 2020 United States of America and really be afraid that you can't speak because you could lose your job or that you other... It's true that it does cut both ways, but the fundamental reality is it cuts in the direction against the Trump supporters at a monumentally higher level than it does against the uh, Biden and Democrat supporters. And I, I don't think we can just call this something that's intangible and something you can't quite put your fingers on. I think it's, it's just obviously so in our faces at this stage that the reality is the uh, and and. I can understand why one may argue against this, but the much of the attackers are so strong, so heavy handed, and they use things like throwing bricks and throwing flasks of urine at people. And unfortunately, they're people that support the democratic causes, and it makes people much more reticent. I, I, I see somebody, uh, uh, there's a million posts going by of people commenting in our live chat, and one of them wrote, I will pee on Trump supporters. You know, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. You just don't hear as many things like that. I'm not saying that Republicans don't say these kinds of things, but you just don't see them anywhere near at the level of people on the other side.
So, Ken, here's the president. The president is basically saying that doctors are deliberately inflating the number of COVID deaths. Uh, do you believe that? David, you know, now we're talking about the single most important topic that our country is facing and has been facing for the last several months. And I want to answer that question squarely. And I want you to give me a moment to let me expound upon my general thoughts on this. Okay. I've become very specific. I do believe that the numbers are being inflated for COVID related deaths. Uh, I believe that they're inflated for a couple different reasons. Uh, first and foremost, what the president just talked about, uh, hospitals get more money by deaths of being caused or being stated that they're caused by COVID-19. Uh, no, they, they get more money based on infections. The deaths mm -hmm. don't matter. When I say first and foremost, I'm not talking about that that's the number one reason. I'm saying first and foremost because I'm squarely responding to that point. Right. I think that that is a smaller issue, though. I do think that those that, that, that does inflate the numbers. I think that there's other issues that inflate the numbers that even the New York Times reported upon that go to things like normally it has to go through like 38 or 37 testing cycles in order for somebody to be noted to be testing positive for COVID, those start inflating numbers. But here's the point I really want to make on this, is that Donald Trump often talks about <clears throat> that the cure can't be worse than the problem itself. But I really want to break that down. It's, it's a matter of fact, not opinion. This is scientific medical fact that significantly more people have died from non-coronavirus problems via the shutdowns and lockdowns than the coronavirus itself. People who have not been able to go to doctors to have things like necessary surgeries, like they call them elective surgeries, like brain surgeries and joint replacements. People who haven't been able to go to doctors to get mammograms and tumor testings. People who haven't been able to go to doctors to get normal checkups that uncover things like cancers and heart diseases. People who are too afraid to go to doctors. People who have uh, mental illnesses or stress-related illnesses that manifest in the physical conditions, increased suicides, increased drug overdoses, increased domestic violence, increased lethargy, increased drunkenness, all the combination of these matters because of lockdowns, because well, Kevin, of shutdowns, have caused Kevin, more you, deaths. You that all those numbers are up. Suicide, drunkenness, opioid overdoses, uh, uh, accidental deaths are up. Um, uh, people who can't uh, catch their diseases in time. I'll grant all that's up, but the numbers that I've seen is that it doesn't add up to the 225,000 deaths that we've already had from, from COVID-19. No, we're, we're going to completely disagree on this. I've researched this at length. I've spoken with, reviewed um, uh, audio tapes, reviewed video recordings, reviewed studies. I mean, uh, to the levels of hundreds and hundreds on this. And the number of people who have died from these non-coronavirus problems that are a direct result from the lockdowns not only supersede, but they far supersede the amount of people who have died from the coronavirus itself. And then you add into, that's why I wanted to take talk about this very general to specific, then you add into it that I don't believe that the coronavirus death toll is as high as it is, starting with that point that President Trump just made in the clip that you read. I don't think that's the biggest point, but I think it's a, num a, a point and you start adding on to it. And it's just, we come to at the end of the day, I know you said you disagree with me before, but all the data I show see is that the coronavirus death rate is actually lower than the flu. I'm going to call it equal to the seasonal flu just because I don't have every single case and, and data and, and statistic in front of me to say that it, it, it definitely supersedes it. But it's clear to me that it almost definitely supersedes it. And at most, it's equal. Well, let's just, well, let's suppose that it's, and I, I want to accept the data, but let's just suppose for argument's sake it is equal, just for the hypothetical. If it is equal, there are certain steps that people are supposed to take when they get the flu to try to mitigate and minimize the chances that the flu is going to kill them from it. What What's wrong with the argument that if the United States had shut down sooner and had imposed more severe sort of lockdowns and if people had started wearing masks sooner, that instead of 225,000 deaths, it might only be, say, 100,000 deaths? Wouldn't that, that have been a worthwhile step? There is a balancing test, David, and in that balancing test, the ultimate and greatest factor, of course, is the preservation of life. That said, I don't want to like use these examples as saying like they're far out because I don't think they're far out. I want to use examples to say that they're right on point. You go hiking, 
you get into a car and you drive, you get on a plane, you do one of a million different things and there's a risk factor. The question yet one has to evaluate in the balancing test and the weighing process is what is the degree of risk? We don't shut down America. We don't make people uh, we don't make people stay at home. We don't force people to not congregate. We don't force people to wear masks. We don't force people to socially distance because of the flu. And it's very simple that we should not be doing the same thing because of the coronavirus. Now, all that said, I certainly believe that people should make their own decisions, that it's wise for certain groups of people who have pre-existing conditions, for people who are at a certain age with certain other types of ailments, that they make decisions to socially distance that they make decisions to stay at home a lot more. But they should make those decisions on their own. The government should not be making those decisions for us. Well, one thing that I will agree with, and that is if people go back to the original purpose of lockdowns, uh, the idea was not necessarily because we were all going to be able to lock down and wait until there's a vaccine and, and save people. The idea was you have a better chance of treating people successfully if the hospitals are not overrun. So in other words, if people are coming in and it's staggered in terms of the infection rates and you have a certain percentage of people who are infected at the beginning and after three months and six months and the hospitals are better equipped to treat those people so that you don't have to make the choices that they made early on in Italy where they had to choose who gets a ventilator and not. It was never, at least my understanding from going back to last March, that the idea was never that, well, you're going to simply stamp out COVID-19 by locking everything down. What you're going to do is you're going to stagger the infection so that everybody who gets it could get fairly treated and doctors don't have to choose. But, uh, but um, uh, look, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, comments here, up to 133 chats. I think you've, uh, you've, yeah, you've I, I fire other people can. Can, can, I, can, I, can I respond to the ones yeah, about masks real quickly? So yeah. I believe that washing hands, I believe that even socially distancing, staying away from people, if you choose, if you want to do that on your own, I believe that those types of things do lower the chances of people getting the flu, of people getting the coronavirus. I think it's obvious. Masks, however, is a complete farce. And here's why. Uh, let's say there's about 100 reasons. I'm going to give you two examples. Number one, you can watch a doctor on numerous videos on YouTube and elsewhere, put on every single type of mask that there is. And this is a fact, again, where there's no opinion. He puts on every type of mask that there is, from the lightest to the strongest. And in every single one of them, using a vape by normal breathing, he shows that the particles, which are the same size or bigger than the aerosols of coronavirus, all go through the mask seamlessly. The masks prevent absolute zero. Dr. Fauci, I don't believe he's a bad person. I believe he seems like he's a pretty decent guy. On March 8th, he told people on 60 Minutes that masks are unnecessary and that there's no reason for people to be wearing them and that he did not stop the spreading this. He reversed himself two, a couple months later. He didn't reverse himself because he said he found out something new. He reversed himself because he said that, well, back on March 8th, I said that because I kind of wanted to hoard the masks for the medical establishment. So that means one of two things. Either on March 8th, he believed that masks are critical to saving lives, yet he lied to America and told us that they weren't necessary just because he wanted to hoard them for the medical establishment. Or on March 8th, he told us the truth, that he really doesn't think that masks are necessary. And I believe he's a good person, so I believe that he told us the truth on March 8th, and he doesn't think they're critical, and he wouldn't have lied to America about it. And for politically expedient reasons, he's saying this. I'm only using Fauci as an example because he's the top bureaucratic doctor. Almost every doctor that I talk to expounds upon what I just stated at the forefront of my mask point, is that they don't stop the spread of anything. If people want to do that, I, I do think that there is, yeah, they don't necessarily stop the spread. Uh, there is, though, some benefit to certain people wearing masks and essentially keeping other people's particles from from getting in but i want to move on because you mentioned the issue of joe biden's mental acuity and here's there's a very good example that's sort of running around in terms of how information sometimes can get taken out of context and i'm not so sure where the truth lies in this next particular clip i'm going to play you but there's a, there's this sort of viral video that's been going around of joe biden who appears to be confusing president trump with george w bush i'm going to play it for you and get your reaction here it is
Okay, so now the a lot of people to, to a lot of people that sorry, kind of so to a lot of people that sounds like he's referring to George W. Bush. However, at this Democratic fundraiser, the person who was moderating, who was interviewing Joe Biden was George Lopez. And so at least Democrats were there saying, no, no, he wasn't referring to George W. Bush. He was trying to engage George Lopez in this conversation about Donald Trump. I'm not sure what to believe. Ken, what do you believe? Oh. <laughs> I, I've been talking about this for months. Probably there was a segment on some major news network. I think you were going on right after me. And we talked about it in the green room uh, after I just talked about it on the show. Look, look, Joe Biden, again, another person who's at, who, he's, the guy's led an incredible career. I mean, he, he, everybody has to admit the guy is is a superstar in terms of success of what you call the American dream. And I'll give him that. Again, he's a guy probably over the history of his career. There might be 30 percent of what he said that I agree with. He's not somebody I completely disagree with until today. <laughs> and I mean today, I mean this election cycle. Now I disagree with him on almost everything. I push all that to the side and say that even if I agreed with this guy on 90% of matters, he can't be president of the United States. He's shot. He really is. He's shot. What, that, that, he clearly was talking about George Bush. Is that alone enough? No. But when you have the guy even a couple of years ago talking about having kids running the hair up and down his legs and how it stands up straight and then the kids sitting on his laps, I mean... I mean, that is just bizarre and weird. I and mean, he was talking about when he was a lifeguard, and, and it, it, uh, you had to have seen that clip. I mean, if you haven't, you have to look it up immediately. I mean, the guy doesn't well, just make gaps. He has, he has well, huge as far as, the, as far as the what people would say, the, the perverted stuff, I, I know a lot of people have worked for Joe Biden for decades who have never seen that behavior. Now, does he speak perhaps in a way that could you know raise some questions, or is he a bit, maybe a bit too friendly and about a bit too touchy? Wait, wait, can I, can I I acknowledge that, but I, I, that's, I guess my, my question, though, is even if wait, wait, can I, can I respond to first? I'm sorry, well, I'm sorry, 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 I'm
Wow. Okay. Well, look, I mean, Ken, you've got a strong opinion and there's certainly a lot of people that agree with you. The question is, are there enough people who agree with you that it's going to make a, a big difference on election day? I'm putting up a map for everybody. This is the... Sorry, I just hit a button by mistake. I'm going to get rid of this. Didn't mean to uh, type that. Um, I'm putting up the map of the 2016 electoral map, the states in red or states that Donald Trump won. Uh, the states in blue are states that Hillary Clinton won. The math was 306 for Trump, 232 for Clinton. You need 270 to become the next president of the United States. I uh, can, based on uh, these states, uh, I mean, go for it. Take it. Take me through which states do you think that uh, Donald Trump um, held? Does he does he hold all of these red states in your estimation, despite uh, all the polls? And it's kind of amazing that the Electoral College, which the which many Democrats arguably want to get rid of, kind of works in their favor because you can win just a handful of states and carry a lot of Electoral College votes. That said, to answer your question, I think Florida is going to definitely go in the way of Trump. I believe that Pennsylvania is extremely likely to go in the way of Trump, almost to the point of being definite. Ohio, I believe, will go for Trump. North Carolina, which he needs to win, uh, I, I, you know, to me, the again, I can't use polls all too often uh, for, for, uh, for, for helping me formulate my opinions, because as I said earlier, I really don't believe in them. Um, but uh, North Carolina, I think it's going to go in his way. I think that Michigan he'd have a problem with, David, but I think that Gretchen Whitmer is so unpopular because she's the strongest of the dictator types with her <clears throat> with her lockdowns that i think democrats uh, uh even democrat voters in in michigan some are going to vote for trump um you know minnesota um that's a tough one yeah yeah M minnesota is minnesota is a tough one uh I, I don't know i don't know which way minnesota is going to go uh, what do you think? <laughs> Me here. So, uh, national Trump, uh, is down by 7.8. Biden had 7.8. Florida. You mentioned Florida right now. The poll has Biden plus 1.8. Georgia. Trump plus 0.4, North Carolina, Biden plus 1.2, Wisconsin, Biden plus 5.5, Michigan, Biden plus 9.0, Pennsylvania, Biden plus 4.8, Ohio, Trump plus 0.6, Arizona, Biden plus 2.4. Again, each of these states that I just mentioned, these are states that Donald Trump won back in 2016. So it becomes a question of, is Ken Del Vecchio correct? Are the polls that far off in all of these states? Is there this large silent majority that's out there? Uh, and if so, then Donald Trump will be reelected. Uh, and according to the, the statisticians, they think that based on the data that they've seen, that there's a one in six chance of Donald Trump winning. Uh, Ken, it sounds like you're more certain about it. Well, I grew up loving baseball stats. And you could give me a number of at-bats and a number of hits, and I can almost off the top of my head divide it in and tell you the batting averages. So I'm going to go with myself, with my giant big ego that's blasting <laughs> out of my head and say, my stats are right here. <laughs> Ken Delvecchio, it is always a pleasure uh, having you on. Even though we disagree about a lot, it's always uh, I always learn something from you. And it's, uh, it's nice that we can have conversations. And I think this is the future of our society, that if we can have people on that we disagree with, but have uh, logic uh, and have arguments that, uh, that are fun and that are pleasant. And believe it or not, folks, there's actually a lot of stuff that Ken and I agree on that we don't have time to talk about now. Um, but uh, but it's always it's always fun talking about this stuff, Ken, with you. I appreciate it. And Ken, by the way, going to be a, a regular on these broadcasts. And so, uh, Ken, we're going to talk to you next week. David, absolutely. It's always my pleasure to be working with you. And I feel the exact same way in return. If we could all just sit down and have logical conversations, we can become a much greater and stronger society. And we don't have to agree, folks. You don't have to agree with your friends, your neighbors, your spouse, or anything like that. But we do have to figure out a way to have these uh, conversations and disagreements, and disagreements in a more uh, civil manner. In any case, that'll do it. Thanks to everybody at Haps and Crickets TV. And on behalf of Ken Delvecchio, I'm David Schuster. Thanks for